are tuned in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, guiding your gridiron journey, none other than your host, former NFL lineman, Ross Tucker. Oh, 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 yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. We are back. It is a Monster Monday new week here on the RT Media Podcast Network, presented, of course, by DraftKings. Love those guys. Make sure you use the code Ross if you're doing anything on the DraftKings sports book we also have the civilian goat greg cosell back here on a monday probably the last monday we'll have greg we'll get back to thursdays i would imagine next week last time we're talking about the draft with greg there's a couple of guys i wanted to ask him about and also there's some guys i'm calling greg's guys that i know that he likes new week by the way which means we'll have some new winners those of you that spread the word via social media in any way, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at Ross Tucker NFL, at Ross Tucker Pod, just a share or a repost or a comment, it all counts. I'm looking for you. Those of you who take advantage of our sponsors, whether it's Factor, those awesome meals my wife crushes, or Good Ranchers, you probably saw me on Instagram, at Ross Tucker NFL, grilling burgers for my family yesterday. Make sure you take advantage of any of our awesome sponsors. MyFrontPageStory.com with Mother's Day coming up on Monday. Anyway, there's a lot to get to always when we have Greg Cosell. You can be the YouTube winner, YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. Okay, so Greg, I don't remember which of some of these guys I wanted to ask you about as opposed to some of the guys that are just more or less guys that you 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 really liked uh, in the process for one reason or another. You gave me a list of guys, Greg. I'll, I'll let you describe the list of guys that you gave me. Oh, uh, now I'm trying to remember the list I gave you. Um, I know I gave you Cole Bishop. I know I gave you Marshawn Nealand. Um, I know I gave you Javon Bullard. Um, yeah, I, I can I, give you the names. I'm asking, like, how would you classify these guys? Why Why are these the names you gave me? Are these, like, day two guys you really like? Well, you know, it's funny that you ask me that because, as a lot of people know, I don't necessarily think in terms of where guys get drafted. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I know the guys I gave you, uh, even before the draft, I knew they wouldn't necessarily be first-round picks. But when I watch these players, number one, I always start with traits and attributes and characteristics of the player. But then I think about how they can be deployed in the NFL, because ultimately that's what teams are doing. They're trying to figure out how a player within the context of their scheme, because once you start talking uh, with coaches about players, they think in terms of scheme adaptability. Scouts, as you know, Ross, think more in terms of traits, attributes, analytics, things of that nature. I'm not saying coaches don't, but coaches for the most part think in terms of how a player fits within their scheme because coaches have a particular scheme and unless a player is transcendent and obviously there's very few of those guys and the players I gave you are not transcendent um, they have to think how does this guy fit in what I do Uh, because I'm not dramatically changing everything I do particularly if I'm a veteran coach so it comes down to scheme adaptability for coaches. Let's start, though, with a guy that I don't know if I would say that he was a surprise first-round pick, but it does feel like he was an interesting first-round pick that's garnered a lot of discussion. And that's not this is not one of Greg's guys, but it's Jordan Morgan. He was the Packers' first-round pick, number 25 overall, the offensive lineman out of Arizona, Greg. What did you see from him? Yeah, he's an interesting player, uh, Ross, because, look, you're an offensive lineman, um, and there's a strong belief among many coaches that I've spoken to that arm length for an offensive lineman is important. Um, And there have been studies done by offensive line coaches. Obviously, they have staffs. I just have me, so I don't do these kinds of studies. But there's a belief that arm length matters significantly. And his arm length is below 33 inches. So even though he played left tackle at Arizona, and I thought his tape was pretty good, and I would imagine they drafted him to play left tackle, that would be my thought, Um, there'll be a question as to whether he can do that, given that his arm length is less than 33 inches. Um, Now, I think that he's 
overall, besides the arm length, he's got very good size. He's a good athlete. He's got light feet. He showed good balance. Um, he has the lateral range, I think, to play left tackle. It's just a question of will that arm length end up being a concern because historically that has been a factor. You know, <clears throat> Greg, I, I do think it matters. I do. Um, and you're talking to a guy, I don't know if we've talked about this in the show before. I knew I had short arms, Greg. I didn't know just how short. I have sub 31 inch arms. Right. And I think it really puts you in a bad spot in one-on-one -on -one pass protection. You know, it's like anything else, right? It's, I mean, there's a reason for boxers why reach matters. Yes. Right? Like they can punch you at a distance where you can't punch them. Well, same thing for offensive linemen. You can touch them, get your hands on them at a distance where they can't do it with you or earlier than me. You know, for me to have sub 31 and another guy to have 34 inch arms, you know, that, that three plus inches, that might not sound a lot like a lot, but at that level, everything is such a like small increments yeah. make a big difference. It I can be no difference. Like the difference, you know, when they say like a running back lost a step, he didn't lose a step. The running back lost a fraction of a second. But that's the difference between getting through the hole or not. No, that, you're that, right. that little bit can be the difference. No, I, I agree. And like I said, they've done studies, and particularly for tackles. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't matter for guards or centers, which is where you predominantly played, but for tackles for sure, because you want to be able to strike. There's a lot of coaches that believe in the independent arm technique where you strike proactively with one arm, and if your arms are shorter, that strike doesn't have the same impact as if your arms are longer. So it'll be interesting. Um, we know that, I mean, I would think they drafted him to get a shot at left tackle, particularly since they drafted him in the first round. To me, this is a wait-and-see situation. I'm not going to sit here and say it can never work. Maybe he's the exception. Um, as I said, he has other traits that are very positive for the left tackle position, but we'll see how it plays out. Another first-round pick that was one of your guys, was one of the guys you sent me, was taken by the Arizona Cardinals, and that's defensive end Darius Robinson out of Missouri. Yeah, I really liked him the more I watched him. Um, and to me, he was a guy you needed to watch a lot because he's so big. He's 6'5", he's 285, I believe, is what he was at the Combine. Um, you know, he's not an explosive athlete. I mean, very few guys that big are explosive athletes. Uh, it's funny, you talk about arm length. This is 34 and a half. Um, but, but the point is, is... He's just a he's a power player. Um, he's got tremendous length and mass throughout his body. His game reflects those attributes. He's got really strong hands. He uses his arms really well. Tremendous arm extension um, to lock out offensive tackles, and they moved him inside as well. Um, he's a sp a strength power generator. That's his game. Now, I'm not going to compare him exactly to Cam Jordan when Cam Jordan came out of Cal, um, but the the measurables are almost exactly the same. Um, so can he become that kind of player as he grows and develops? We'll have to wait and see. I think the belief when Cam Jordan came out was that he was a little, just a little quicker athlete and maybe a better sort of pure pass rusher. But I think there's more in Robinson to be developed and I, like I said, you needed to keep watching him because he's not the kind of guy where one play you're going to go, wow, look at, look at that. But the more you watch him, you just realize how physically dominant he can be. Yeah, and I think a guy with that body type, um, those are not fun guys to go against No, at times, uh, especially if they can generate some speed to power like that. It's funny, as you were describing him, all I was thinking was Cam Jordan, Cam Jordan. You know, let's get to some other guys. A lot of these guys went in the second round. And I, I, I think it was you, but there was other people in the pre-draft process, Greg, that really liked uh, A.D. Mitchell, Adonai Mitchell, the wide receiver from Texas, who ended up getting drafted by the Colts at 52. That surprised me. He lasted 20 picks 
into the second round. What did you see from him? Any idea why maybe he lasted that long? Maybe there's some personality stuff, which I certainly don't know, so I couldn't speak to that. Um, I will say that I spoke to one coach who's been in the league for 30 years on the offensive side of the ball, and he had Mitchell as his third-rated wide receiver ahead of Adunze. So Mitchell uh, has tremendous talent. 6'2", 205, ran a 4-3-4. I mean, tremendous vertical jump and broad jump. Really, really good athlete. This guy could get in and out of breaks. He showed the ability to sink his hips, and he is, and he can run. I mean, he can get over the top. I finished watching him, and I thought to myself that he has the traits and attributes to be a boundary X receiver, meaning the single receiver to the short side of the field that gets a lot of man-to-man coverage and that would have to win one-on-one. Uh, and I thought that this guy, again, I don't know the kid, so maybe there's factors there. But just based on tape, Ross, I thought he had the the traits and attributes to develop into a a top 10 receiver in the league as his career develops. I don't want people to think I mean he would be that from day one, but I think he has the traits to be that kind of receiver. Interesting. I I can't remember if he's the guy that Chris Ballard went off on because there was people talking about stuff off the field with him or not. I need I need to look that up because um, there was somebody that Chris Ballard really got fired up about when he was asked about it. I get fired up in a different way, Greg, when I drink Labatt Blue Light. It is so good. Big fan of drinking Labatt Blue Lights with my friends and family, living life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly beer, Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. Okay, some other guys... We can get to a couple safeties, Greg. I feel like we don't talk about safeties that much. Javon Bullard from Georgia, Cole Bishop from Utah. Yeah, let's start with Cole Bishop. Cole Bishop, again, he was probably in terms of, you know, when I say a guy's one of my favorite guys, I think a lot of people think it's a personal thing. It's just a tape thing. Um, I watched him last summer, 2022, from his 2022 uh, tape. Um, I watched him, uh, of course, this year, his 2023 tape. Um, I think I thought he was one of the best safety prospects in the class. Size, movement, versatility, competitive, savvy, intelligence. I thought he could play back end. I thought he could play in the box. I thought he could match up to tight ends. Um, I think he has enough movement that he could be a, a cover one or a cover three post safety. Um, I just really thought he was a complete safety, and it didn't surprise me that the Bills drafted him because what do the Bills ask of their safeties? What have we seen them do with Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer the last number of years, Ross? they Those guys are interchangeable within the context of a Sean McDermott defense, and Cole Bishop fits that. He's an interchangeable player who can play in the box. He can be an overhang player. He can match up to the tight end. He can play on the back end. He sort of fits clearly what we've seen the safety profile be for the Buffalo Bills. Love it. Um, I also, it's funny, when you talk about Darius Robinson, it makes me think a little bit, Greg, about Marshawn Neeland. Ah. Not, not, Not exactly the same, but I did a couple of Western Michigan games, and just in terms of being a power player, that's yeah. kind of what I think of for Marshawn. That's what he is. I mean... Uh, And maybe people don't realize that this guy's close to 270 pounds, too. Um, He plays a strong man's game, as you know, Ross, since you mentioned you did a couple of games. He's got powerful, heavy hands. Um, He can shock both offensive tackles and tight ends in the run game. Um, He showed forceful speed-to-power conversion as an edge pass rusher. Quite frankly, I thought after I finished watching him, and I did him later in the process— I thought he and Jared Verse were the most explosive speed-to-power conversion players of any pass rushers in this draft. And the other thing that I really liked about Nealon, which again, now you think about his transition and projection to the league, is they moved him around a lot. He stood up a lot. You know, he was kind of a joker. He was not just a pure edge player. And now you go to the Cowboys, and they have... Parsons, who obviously does the same thing. Um, And again, I'm not comparing the players, so I hope people don't think that's what I mean. But now you've got two players that can move around, and you can try to create one-on-one matchups based on where you can line them up. 
but I was surprised how much Nealon stood up as kind of a joker in the middle of the defense, and they tried to get him matched up on centers and guards, as well as lining him up outside where he could rush the quarterback against tackles. Greg, what about a guy I don't think we did talk about in the pre-draft process at all? And I, I'm curious about him, obviously, because I'll be doing the Eagles preseason games, and they took him in the third round. And I, I need to know more about his backstory. I got to figure out how a guy gets from Cornell as a safety to Houston Christian as an as a defensive end. But it's Jalex Hunt. Did you get a chance to watch Jalex Hunt at I all? I did. And I thought he was one of the most fascinating prospects in the draft. I mean, he's 6'4", 252, incredibly good athlete. I mean, you know, again, because he played at, at Houston Christian. You know, in fact, I had a conversation uh, with our good friend Fran Duffy, and I said, I wonder where he would have been drafted if he did the exact same thing in the SEC. And Fran said, well, that would probably lead to a different conversation. But the point is, is the traits are the same. Now, granted, he obviously didn't play against the highest level of competition, but this guy is a long, athletic, edge defender. He's got emerging pass rush traits. It'll probably take a little time. Uh, they're they're probably more in their infancy than all there. Um, so he's got a smaller toolbox right now. But you talk about length, natural athleticism, explosiveness. Those things are high level. Um, and, you know, he definitely can bend. Uh, he can flatten his rush path. There's so much there to work with that I was, again, I knew nothing about. I, I saw him at the Combine, obviously, Ross. So I knew the name. Uh, and he actually had a nice Combine. But, I, you know, when I put on his tape, and again, the competition level's different. But, boy, you just see the physical traits. They jumped out. Love it. Um, I mentioned Javon Bullard earlier from Georgia. He was one of your guys as well, Greg. Yeah, I love Javon Bullard. Um, Javon Bullard to me was maybe not quite as, as good, but somewhat similar in many ways to Brian Branch of Alabama from a year ago. Two years ago in 2022, Bullard was the slot corner for um, Georgia. This year, he was a safety. And I think this guy just besides the obvious versatility, simply because of the change of position, this guy just understands how to play. He's not the best athlete, just like Branch wasn't the best athlete. Although I think Bullard ran better uh, than people probably thought uh, that he would run. His other athletic testing measurables were by no means off the charts. Um, but this guy is, is, he's not twitchy. He's not sudden. You wouldn't say he's got super loose hips. Um, but this guy is a smart, savvy player. You can see the higher level football intelligence, great recognition instincts, sees the game incredibly well. Um, and, you know, he can play in the slot. This year, uh, they matched him up, even though he was a safety when they played Missouri. They matched him up to Luther Burden, who's probably going to be a top 10 or top 15 pick next year in the 2025 draft. Um, so, you know, he can do that. So I just really liked the way he played. He saw the game really, really well. Some of the other guys you gave me, Greg, uh, Renardo Green, Caden Wallace, who I know a lot about from Penn State, DJ Glaze, Malik Washington. Hit, hit up one of those other guys other than Caden Wallace, since I'm familiar with him. Tell me about one of those other guys. I would say Renardo Green is somebody I would love to mention because Renardo Green was a guy that I've watched for two years. And he came from Florida State, which is a man-heavy defensive team. A lot of press. So he has a ton of ex experience playing press, both mirror match and targeted physicality. And this guy, I mean, he is a physical, tough, hard-nosed player. Um you know, he kind of reminded me watching his tape of what Lejarius Sneed has become in the league. And don't forget, Lejarius Sneed was a fourth round pick at a Louisiana Tech. So it's what Sneed has become in the league. And obviously those who follow the league know he's, he's now with the Tennessee Titans. But Green is a physical, tough player, brings a swagger. Um, I just really like the way he played. Obviously, the Niners are looking for uh, more corners. Um, and I think he's, I really liked watching his tape. Love it. I like talking with you every single week, Greg. Really, really appreciate it. Glad we got to dive into a few more of your guys. Next week, we're going to start to preview division by division. Just go over some of these teams, what we're expecting from them. Obviously, a lot of additions and new coaches. It should be fun. Thank you so much, as always. Thanks, Ross. Appreciate it.
Gosh, I love Greg so good. I love just the passion he has when he talks about certain players. That's kind of like the passion I have for myfrontpagestory.com. I forgot to mention this earlier in the show. Maybe I did. At any rate, reminder, Mother's Day is Sunday, and I'm signing an autograph, signed autograph for any of you that get the best Mother's Day gift ever for any of the moms in your life, myfrontpagestory.com. That simple. Tux takes. All right, Ross. Well, the biggest news from the weekend, the Dolphins, they bring in wide receiver Odell Beckham Jr. Yeah, it's kind of funny to me that that's the biggest news. I mean, you know what? I'm going to make that, Jack, my meaty Monday for the week. It's presented by GoodRanchers.com, America's best meat delivered to your door. Use code Ross for 15% off a better way to buy meat at goodranchers.com. Odell Beckham Jr. is like an incredible case study in the power of getting off to a really fast start or to becoming really popular on social media. Like it is insane that he got $15 million fully guaranteed last year. It's wild that he signs with the Dolphins And it's still big news that everybody's posting about. Do you realize it's been since 2016 since he had had 1,100 yards in the season or caught 80 passes or had more than six touchdown catches? That's a long, that's like when Drake May and Caleb Williams were like 14 years old. It's been a long time. And yet people still, Odell Beckham Jr. signed with the Ravens and Lamar last year. Odell Beckham Jr. signed with the Dolphins. Like, When's the last time it's actually mattered or meant anything who Odell Beckham Jr. signed with? Alongside Drake May, Kill Williams, I also was about 14, 15 years old. Some other nice. roster moves. Patriots signed kicker Joey Sly. Bill signed linebacker Deion Jones as well as defensive lineman Dwayne Smoot and wide receiver Chase Claypool. Another wide receiver, DJ Chark. He goes to the LA Chargers. So it's Dewan Smoot, I believe. Not Dwayne Smoot, but that's a tough one. Um, you know, you almost forget certain guys. Deion Jones was so good for a while there, and it kind of feels like he just fell off. You know, the Bills, this is called supplementing your roster post-draft. These guys don't count as compensatory picks against the compensatory pick formula. And also, they just they want to make sure they've got depth at certain spots. But like a guy like Chase Claypool, man, he got off to a fast start. And now he's just like a journeyman, just bouncing around. And he could get cut and be out of the league. It's it's amazing how fast it happens. And I feel like DJ Chark signs a one-year deal up to some amount with a different team each year. We will see whether or not he has any impact. I will say this, feels like there's opportunity with the Chargers. I mean, feels like there is... You better, you better, you better be ready to block. What's that Adam Silver, um, that Adam Silver meme? Learn how to block, buddy, DJ Shark, um, because the Chargers want to run the football. But there is opportunity. I mean, there's opportunity to be a starting receiver for the Chargers. Yep. So the fifth year option deadline was Thursday, and the most notable decision from that was the Steelers. They declined to pick up the option on running back Najee Harris. You know, it's interesting. I mean. With rare exception, I would say that if your team doesn't pick up your fifth-year option, it was a bad pick. And I think even with Najee Harris, you could say that. But Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Mac Jones, Zayvon Collins, Jamin Davis. That's a couple off-the-ball linebackers, by the way. They were taken top 20. Not good. Kadarius Toney, Caleb Farley, Najee Harris, Peyton Turner, Eric Stokes, Joe Tryon, Shoinka. Alex Leatherwood and Rashad Bateman not even eligible for the fifth-year option. Not a good sign. I mean, Najee Harris has been a fine pick, but it still says a lot about a lot, maybe a lot about the running back position that the Steelers did not did not pick that up. And NFL general counsel Jeff Pash, he's retiring after 40 years. Do you know that name at all, Jack? Do not. That's so interesting. So he's probably one of the... 10 most influential figures in the NFL over the last 30 years. 
in terms of the business of the NFL, but usually behind the scenes, you know, in the negotiations, in these investigations, all that stuff. So that'll be interesting to see who the NFL replaces him with, but a very, very impactful guy. Anyway, I think we're done here. Thanks for tuning in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also check out Even Money, Fantasy Feast, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network on Samsung TV+, Plus, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. Shout out MyFrontPageStory.com. Told you earlier in the show, I'm giving out an autograph to anybody that gets one of these incredible stories for a mom in their life. You talk to a writer for 10 minutes, tell them how great your mom or wife or whoever is. They write this incredible story. Looks like it's on the cover of the newspaper, framed. I can almost guarantee they will cry happy tears when they read the quotes. MyFrontPageStory.com. Also, shout outs to BackOfficeSchedule.com, SteakhouseSports.com, HumanHeadNYC.com, Sportaculture, Pizza Boy Brewing.